All right, as we continue our journey kind of from global to national to, uh, to state, uh, now we step into northern Colorado. And the, the closer we get to home, the more people it takes, you know, because we're doing more things, I suppose. But no. Uh, but I'm going to introduce three speakers this time who are going to give us an overview of the uh, uh, activity and the initiatives uh, in terms of energy and sustainability in northern Colorado. Uh, the three speakers are Larry Burkhart, Becky Safaris, and Bruce Beegee. Uh, Larry Burkhart is the president and CEO of Upstate Colorado Economic Development. Uh, he's going to give us an overview of the economic development activity in Upstate Colorado. His area is, is it just Weld County, Larry, or is it bigger than It's Weld County, which is huge. It's the second largest, um, fa second fastest growing metropolitan statistical area in the country. Uh, Becky Safrick is the Community Development Director for the City of Greeley. Becky will be giving us an overview of the activities related to the Western Sugar Tax Incre Increment Financing District, also known as the Leprino uh, Project, I think. Uh, and Bruce Beegee, who is the Economic Develop Man Development Manager for the City of Greeley, will be discussing some of the activity that's underway that's very exciting, I think, that's related to potential opportunities for connecting agribusiness with clean energy technology. Uh, so without further ado, please walk me, walk, join me in welcoming Larry, Becky, and Bruce. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Roger. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on such an important day as today is. Uh, from a sustainability point of view, this is a very critical day because it's the opening day of Major League Baseball, and that by itself will go a long way to sustaining me into the fall. So thank you for that. As Roger mentioned, I'm from Upstate Colorado Economic Development. We are a public-private nonprofit corporation that is responsible for local economic development services in the 4,000 square mile area of Weld County, which includes 31 communities. As you can imagine, this is an extremely diverse area economically and demographically, and clearly it's a big challenge to provide economic development services. However, uh, as I hope you all realize, Weld County has been extremely successful over the past several years in securing significant economic development opportunity for all of its residents and throughout northern Colorado as well. We are governed by a 27-member board of directors that reflects that public-private character uh, representing business, education, and government. We are an organization that seeks to enhance the local economy by serving as a catalyst on the one hand or a facilitator for economic development. Let's talk just very quickly about and frame what we mean by economic development. This is a process of commu creating community wealth by supporting the process of primary sector job creation. That's really what our focus is. A primary job is one that brings new money into the local economy by selling a product or a service made within the community, selling it outside, returning new money that then goes to support the retail, the service, and the professional sectors of the local economy. It's absolutely essential that there be primary employment in our community. Without it, to be quite honest, we don't have a community. Uh, I'm challenged on that from time to time, and I would suggest to you, if you doubt that comment, to drive up into the mountains and take a look at the ghost towns where there had been mining activity during the 19th and maybe early 20th centuries. When the mining activity left those communities, which in fact was its primary employment, the communities dried up and blew away. One of the other important inherent qualities of primary jobs is the fact that they carry with them a multiplier, and that's only logical given the uh, context that I just spoke about. A multiplier being that factor over and above the job itself that goes to support the local economy. In other words, as we bring in more manufacturing, as we bring in people who are making and selling products outside, that means we have to bring in more doctors, more dry cleaners, more restaurateurs into our community to support that infrastructure, that primary sector infrastructure. 
Our basic economic development programs include working with the local primary sector employers on retention and expansion efforts. This statistically is the source of the majority of new job growth in most communities. And I have to say here in Weld County over the past several years that may not be the case. Weld County has enjoyed significant success over and above what we would see throughout the rest of the country. When you stop and think about the fact that this area has successfully attracted companies like OI, Front Range Energy, Vestas Blades, Holden Marketing Group, Leprino Foods, Abound Solar, and others, most communities in the country would give their eye teeth for any one or two of those projects within a 10-year period. And we have been fortunate enough to attract many of these, all of those, within a very short period of time. But the retention expansion remains an important component of economic development. These are the companies who have already made a commitment to your area. They've invested in your community. These are the companies that play a significant role of ambassador when you're trying to attract a new company. What do I mean by that? Think for a moment. If I'm a, a, a New Jersey manufacturer of plastic parts, the likelihood is I'm not going to pick up the phone and call Becky Safrick. I'm not going to call Pam Shaddock, who's on the city council. I'm not going to call the Chamber of Commerce. What I am going to do, most likely, is pick up the phone and call a competitor in the same or related industry that I'm in and say, how is it to do business in Greeley, Colorado? What's the regulatory climate? Are you able to attract and retain the kind of workers that you need there? Can you be competitive within this marketplace? Now, if an existing employer in Greeley, Colorado, who gets that call, just went through an onerous permitting process through the city of Greeley, chances are you're not going to get the best report. Now, that would never happen within the city of Greeley. We all know that. So the fact is that we're going to get a good report, but, but these primary employers who are already here are critical not only to the growth of the job base, but to attract new ones. Our second program is attraction of new companies. Uh, if you stop and think for a minute, there are any estimates of anywhere from eight to 15,000 organizations like Upstate Colorado Economic Development operating throughout the United States. They are vying for an estimated 1,500 sizable projects in any given year throughout the country. You do the math. It's not that attractive. Competition is fierce. Uh, there are a small number of projects, and that's why we try and do the most efficient, targeted job possible. We use very what we consider very highly effective marketing tools. We build relationships with consulting firms who are working with these companies. In, our, in the case of Upstate Colorado Economic Development, we employ a GIS-enabled website that allows a company or a consultant to search for properties, whether it be vacant land or existing buildings by size, type, or location, uh, generate their own demographic report, salary report, consumer expenditure reports, gives them in-depth, detailed information on our area. Now, having said that, when an employer looks at us, they're not looking at Weld County by itself. They're not looking at the city of Greeley by itself. They're looking at a region. And it depends on the industry sector as to what defines the region. But as we're talking about sustainability today, as we're talking about renewable energy in part today, that region encompasses possibly as many as four counties that we market actively. Boulder, Larimer, Weld, and Adams. Stop to think a minute. National Renewable Energy Laboratories, Siemens, R&D facility outside of, of CU, CU, CSU, Vestas Blades, Abound Solar. This is a region that we can package and with, with some critical mass put in front of a site selector, put in front of a supplier, put in front of an OEM in that industry effectively and say, this is where you want to come if you're interested in renewable energy. The site selection process is one of, of elimination. Consultants and companies sometimes start with as many as three dozen communities that they're looking at. And through a process of elimination, they get down to one or two that they consider most, uh, most, uh, more, more in depth. So anything that they find of 
issue in your community, no matter how small, is a reason to eliminate you. That's the point that they're trying to get to. Uh, the most important thing is to listen to the client, to hear what they have to say, what their needs are, what their challenges are, and then to encourage them to walk the ground here in your community to get a feel for how we might be able to best serve them. Important factors for industry to locate in the area include labor. First and foremost, a company has to be able to secure the labor that they need and retain them effectively. Schools. The quality of schools, K-12, are critical to a, a company's decision. Not only is that the pipeline for new employees over the next several years, but it also is where you're asking, the company is asking to put their employees' children for their own uh, education. Business and regulatory climate are critical. Taxes, permitting, because these, these decisions are made on the basis of, of bottom line factors. Access, we have to be able to bring raw materials in, send finished goods out. Access to airports are critical, and we have a significant advantage in this part of the world with the proximity of Denver International Airport. It's a huge asset. Quality of life is something that we hear a whole lot in the economic development field. People will say, well, now, Larry, why wouldn't any company just want to live here? I mean, just look at the beauty of this place. And in fact, quality of life is one of the relatively insignificant factors associated with a site selection decision. It is an important factor if a company is looking to hire outside, from outside the community. And these tend to be the more highly paid jobs, those that can commute longer distances to work. If the company is dependent on attracting employee base from outside the community, quality of life is significant as a factor for decision for site selection. If they're hiring from within the community, it's not important because the company figures the folks that are living there have already determined that this is a viable place for them to, to live, and it's not an issue. Targeting. What does upstate Colorado target? What does it feel to be an appropriate industry mix and those that might find a, a, a synergy here in our area uh, and be uh, amenable to locating. Certainly ag. We remain the eighth most productive county in the, in the United States for agricultural production. The only one of the top ten that's not located in the state of Col uh, California. Food processing. Related industry. Uh, significant resources in food processing and you're going to hear about one of those important projects here in a minute energy, both fossil fuel with more than 13,000 active oil and gas wells in Weld County. We lead the state in that activity as well as renewable energy with some of the companies that I've described to you, whether it be in solar, wind, biofuels, conservation, or the development of electric vehicles. We have it all here in Weld County already. Manufacturing, we have several examples of successful manufacturing companies, and we're going to see more of that activity. Business services, such as State Farm, and logistics. With the population growth that we've seen and will continue to see in Weld County, logistics is a natural target for our industry. Uh, we get our leads from a variety of sources. We partner with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade at the state level. We partner with Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation and we get leads that come directly to us. I want to just spend just a quick moment on that because I think it is extremely important. We have a number of communities. One of the struggles that I have as I go around Well County is to try and, and, and gain an understanding within that community that if you're a population of 5,000 or 50,000, you're not going to be successful in marketing yourself to industry. Because when these decisions are made, companies are looking, again, at regions. If they're looking at the Rocky Mountain West, they know Colorado and they know Denver. They don't know Meade, Firestone, Greeley, Windsor, unless they happen to be within a, a related industry that's a focus in that area. So we leverage the presence of Well County and all of its communities through our partnerships with the state and the Metro Denver EDC. Uh, we had involvement with Leprino Foods from the beginning. This is one of the companies that contacted our office directly. I'm thinking it's probably been nearly two years ago now. They are a very, very deliberate uh, 
and thorough uh, company. They were referred to us by the Dairymen's Association as being a place that they needed to look for supply of milk, for business climate, and for competitive labor. Uh, the important factors to Laprino included milk supply, transportation access, the costs of the property, the site preparation, etc. Labor. Now let me give you an example. This is the only time I've ever been asked to do this, but the company was so concerned about the quality of labor that they asked us to set an appointment with both the police chief of Greeley and the Weld County Sheriff so that they could get a better understanding of the character of the individuals living in our area because they knew those were going to be Laprino employees and they put a lot of stock in the char character of their employees. And finally, another big consideration was the environmental uh, uh, re regulations here in, in Weld County. Upstate Colorado worked to package the incentives at a local, state, and county level. We worked very closely and continue to ver work very closely with the city of Greeley which has done a magnificent job. If, in fact, there's a, a case study to be done, this really has been an exceptional case study of how economic development works. It's no one organization. It's no one agency. It's no one individual that gets these things done. And in the case of Laprino, as you're going to hear uh, as I turn the microphone over to Becky, this was a partnership that continues to this day to bring value to the company. And we're very pleased to be a part of that process. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Can you hear me okay? All right. We couldn't say anything better than saying cheese. We are so happy to have this business here. And I want to tell you a little bit about this story because it's really pretty special. I think we've had some unusual factors that make this um, a really Cinderella story in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that I want to approach uh, as I talk about economic development and sustainability is redevelopment of property. Um, in a community, one of the things that is so dynamic for us is how you use every part of your community. And that has to do an awful lot with our ability to reuse property that has already been used once before. And so the story that I'm going to tell you today is uh, kind of picking up from what Larry said in terms of economic development. This is a story about how to sustain your community by reusing property in creative ways. And so this is a story about urban renewal and financing and how you can make that happen. I want to talk to you a little bit about what is urban renewal because a lot of folks aren't very familiar with that. Urban renewal authorities actually derive their authority um, from state law. Uh, authorities have very specific powers, duties, and obligations as it relates to specifically what's called the elimination of blight in defined areas of a community. Um, blight isn't a word we like to use with almost anything, but it is the one that we're handed to by the state statutes that help us define areas of the community that might deserve additional economic attention. Um, the Greeley Urban Renewal Authority, or as we call GURA, is a seven-member citizen advisory board that's appointed by city council. And this Urban Renewal Authority in Greeley has been around since 1969. Um, the Urban Renewal Authority also acts as an agent for the city. We administer certain federal housing programs. Those include community development block grant funds and also home funds, which are specific housing dollars. Um, we also develop specific strategies for distressed neighborhoods to address area deterioration. And that also then creates opportunities for reinvestment and revitalization. We also manage special redevelopment funding districts. And the one I'm going to talk about today is the tax increment uh, development districts. Since 2004, we've done a couple strategic plans um, that have been developed for four different areas of our community. One is the university area. And in fact, you're going to be hearing a lot more um, of you of, as, with our university partners. We're going to be talking about a university district, uh, not necessarily a tax increment district, but a redevelopment district that will be more strategic. And that's on the boards for this next year. We also have studied the 10th Street corridor. Um, that's where the new cop shop is located over there across from McDonald's. Um, we also have, and that's creating a whole new tax increment neighborhood market area. Our John Evans Greeley Mall area is another area for, that we've looked at for strategic redevelopment and we'll be working um, in this next uh, several months to develop a redevelopment plan for that area. And then the Sunrise Park neighborhood, which is the area that's on the east side of the community. Um, this, this boundary is essentially what our urban renewal district is. And uh, just to give you a couple of benchmarks, it goes up to the Cache Laputa River around the eastern portion of the community. This is 35th Avenue. This is 10th Street that comes in. It wraps around our older um, residential neighborhoods down by the university, which is right here, and then the uh, hillside neighborhood, and then the Greeley Mall area, and back up. This is the area right here that I'm going to be focusing on in this discussion. This is uh, the Western Sugar area. This is the Sunrise Park neighborhood that's on the east side. 
the Sunrise Park neighborhood was, uh, this plan was adopted in 2006. Um, and we were doing a number of different neighborhood plans at the time. And part of that was to identify how we might best look at keeping those neighborhoods healthy. There are older neighborhoods. They've seen some deterioration. Curb, gutter, sidewalk, street lighting, a number of things that were requests for those neighborhoods. Um, and so we did um, identify some improvements that would be useful from the standpoint of those uh, infrastructure improvements. But as part of that study, that neighborhood study, the neighbors in that community said, we'd really like you to take a look at whether there's something you can do for jobs and the industry that's also located over here. In fact, that's where, of course, Greeley's uh, industrial development and the whole town labor area started. So in June of 2007, um, the Urban Renewal Authority authorized us to take a look at the area east of US 85, um, that Western Sugar area, as a potential tax increment district. Some of those study components require that we, um, if as you're studying this, you can follow the state statutes. Area conditions um, of this blight study include a, a review of specific area conditions to determine whether there are physical, social, and economic distress, again, as defined by the state statutes. Um, and then if you do find that there's adequate proof of these uh, conditions of blight, then you have to come up with a redevelopment plan. This boundary, as I was mentioning to you, includes, uh, here's the Cashlaputa River right here. This actually goes up to East 8th Street, which takes you out to the airport. Uh, this is the edge of the city of Greeley property, which is why this uh, is kind of a sawtooth boundary down here. 16th Street, or, or rather uh, 16th Street right here, 13th Street, I'm sorry, this, yes, yeah, 16th Street and 13th Street. And then this is the edge of the, all of this is the Western Sugar property. Um, in our condition survey, by the way, we studied a much larger area than just the West, Western Sugar property. We studied 220 acres of industrial zone property, included 70 individual parcels. Um, we needed to have a boundary that was cohesive and all attached together to make this a, an area plan. Um, the area north of the river was actually included only because it was part of the Western Sugar holdings. Otherwise, that might have been an area we could have separated out. Um, and only the city of Greeley property was eligible for inclusion in the tax increment district. I'm not going to cover all of these, but these give you a, sort of an example of the conditions that you have to find. You had to find at least four of these conditions existed to be able to declare this a blighted area. Either there were deteriorating structures, the street layout was defective, faulty lot layout, unsafe can, uh, conditions, topography or un, uh, inadequate public facilities, uh, defective un, or, or unmarketable title, environmental contamination, and there was lots of that, um, or underutilization. So we had to look at these kind of criteria. There were 50 conditions in all that we had to look at in these different areas. I want to give you an example of some of the things that we found. Um, on the top left, uh, deteriorating structures. This is, this is a pretty common um, view of what we had. There's a lot of residential structures in this area of town, very old. Um, in fact, much of this housing that was over there was uh, worker housing that came along with the original Western Sugar uh, beet plant, so over 100 years old. Um, this one, as we showed up to it, the door was open. We thought it was an abandoned property. In fact, it had just been broken into, um, so there was some police records and, and that sort of thing that had to be followed up as well. Um, in terms of street layout, you can see these are the old uh, uh, spurred line, uh, railroad lines. There's no curb, gutter, sidewalk delineation between the street and the front of the buildings. A lot of the buildings had these uh, kind of false fronts on them. This was a big aluminum uh, front on the, this building, which had pretty much a flat roof and very uh, dated kind of look to it. Um, we looked at unsafe or unsanitary conditions that included such things as um, obviously there was weed growth. This, these were nearly six foot high. Um, you can see kind of the fence line in the background. We um, uh, compared police dispatch calls to another area that was also industrial because you have to kind of compare is this unusual to this neighborhood or this kind of land use. What we found is in this particular neighborhood our police dispatch calls were about five times what they were in other parts of the community. Um, substandard structures, again, um, these are very tiny homes, less than 600 square feet a lot of times, not much more than some people have for apartments. And uh, again, they had lots and yards that were in pretty poor condition. This is one that you can still go out there and find today. This is a pallet um, company. They um, just manufacture and, and sell and, and lease out pallets. Um, and they have them, uh, you can see here, almost to the roof of the house, uh, surrounding the house. Our Union Colony Fire Rescue guys just, just pale at the thought of what could happen if uh, those things caught on fire. So we did a composite to find out what in this area worked as far as this uh, definition. So um, we had to find at least four factors of blight. Everything that's red indicates where there were at least four factors. And in fact, uh, what you can see down here is that we found throughout this entire area that there were nine of the 11 factors that were needed um, to uh, formulate this as a tax increment district. So we easily felt like we met that standard. Um, then we had to come up with some redevelopment ideas. What could you do with this site? 
Um, so one thought we had, and this was well before Laprino, we said, well, what we could look at is an industrial campus where each of these are maybe 10 or 15 acre lots. Uh, well County Business Park had developed a model that was pretty successful. We thought this might be one way we could redevelop the site. Another, we did four of these different scenarios. This is another one that we looked at. Uh, in this case, we rerouted the uh, Ash Avenue, the route road that was on the east side. We developed a site that would be for one larger user and kind of looked at it as a more campus use and then had some small tracks on the south. Um, so these were all things that we're thinking of. And this was a part of what we were doing well before um, Laprino was even on the scene. Well, what is tax increment financing? One thing that's real important to stress is it does not create any new taxes or provide relief for payment of taxes. Um, any entity that is developing on the site pays the same taxes they would for any other kind of development. But what it allows is for the Urban Renewal Authority to retain taxes that are generated from new construction from that site. So if you're building a site, you're going to have an increase in your value. That increase in value is what the Urban Renewal Authority can capture to help with redevelopment opportunities. That uh, tax increment district sunsets after 25 years uh, unless redevelopment mission is accomplished sooner. Another way to look at that, this is a graph to help you kind of uh, get a sense of this. Assuming that your tax increment district is adopted in year one, what happens is the taxes that are uh, at that time available to such entities as the city, the county, the school district, and others stay static over that period of time. It doesn't go any lower, but it stays even. So they're not hurt by the fact that there's an urban renewal project going through there. But as new development occurs, um, and that's stimulated by this ability, you have this ability to capture this amount of new tax revenue. What you can do is pledge that towards bonds. You can make a redevelopment uh, deals with the uh, owner of the property so that they can recapture some of their investment into the property. And at the end of 25 years, what happens is that all the tax entities should see an increase in their total valuation as a result of the fact that you've been able to create a redevelopment project on the site. So again, um, this is a 25-year window for us to um, get redevelopment projects underway, and if we're successful, we can use this to help provide some of those incentives, and at the end of that period, um, the community and particularly the tax, taxing entities are much better off for that. Um, with regard to the Western Sugar Blight designation, the council um, did approve that in January of 2008. What it did is this uh, hatched marked area was where the urban renewal boundaries uh, were before then. We expanded the boundaries to include that area. Let me tell you a little bit about who Laprino is. Um, as Larry mentioned, they're the world's largest manufacturer of mozzarella cheese. They supply places like Pizza Hut, Domino's, Papa John's, as well as individual cheese products. If you go to almost any outlet like Walmart or whatever, they have individual cheese products guaranteed that those are um, probably going to be the uh, Laprino cheese foods. Um, Laprino is international. They operate nine plants in the United States. They also have one in the uh, UK, and they have one fairly close to us in Fort Morgan. Specifications, uh, as Larry said, one, among the things that they needed to have is they needed to be close to their products. So they had to find a place where they could be near areas where cows are. Um, they will be generating between or a need for between five to six million pounds of milk per day, per day. That's a lot of milk. And we have cows in this area of the world, so we think that's a pretty positive thing. We know the site had to be large enough to accommodate at least a 400,000 square foot building for the first phase and up to 870,000 square feet by the end. Um, needed to have good access, needed to have rail or highway access if possible, and the development incentives were needed to offset the cost of development. So we thought, well, we have something here that might be of interest to Laprino. Um, we have a site that's about 100 acres. This is the old Western Sugar building right here. You can see the um, storage silos there. It happened to be for sale at the time that we were um, looking with Laprino for area availability. Rail spur and highway access was important. We have a rail spur on the site. However, that was uh, told to us at some point that that may or may not be available, and yet we were still going to explore that option. And they're very close, of course, to US Highway 85 and 263 on the north. They were within, at this point, the tax increment district. There were plenty of dairies nearby that, whose herds could be grown to provide the supply they needed. And the site and industry was eligible for additional um, economic development incentives, as Larry mentioned. But there were some issues with this site as well. Nothing happens easily in redevelopment areas. And so among the things that were concerns is this building was, was pretty much obsolete, even though it's a wonderful historic building in the stand, from the standpoint that it had a lot of historic characteristics. It was not useful. It was totally obsolete for any kind of contemporary use. And we knew that there were hazardous materials on site. So, for example, asbestos. Um, oil and gas well sites were, are also located there that you needed to figure out how you're going to work around. 
Um, there was also a volume of lime, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, UP had by then decided that it was not going to allow rail access across US 85 because they felt that that would be too much of a conflict on a regular basis with um, automobile traffic. And of course, the site was also in a floodplain. That's a lot of warts on a piece of property that you need to overcome. And so that much more important for us to have something like a tax increment districts or some other incentives to work with. So let me tell you a little bit about some of these special issues. We're standing on top of the silos there um, on Western Sugar. And to the north um, is our wastewater control facility. Here's US 85. Um, this is to the north and east. And what you see here, um, this is that little section that's north of the river. And this is a lime deposit. It's about 20 feet high. Lime happens to be a byproduct of the uh, sugar beet processing. It's not toxic by itself, but in large quantities, it's much like having a huge pile of fertilizer or something that has the potential to have environmental um, hazards if it's leached or if, it, if it's uh, in any way exposed to water or other areas. So here's Ash Avenue. This happens to be over here, an area where the Urban Renewal Authority also had purchased about 70 acres of property uh, where there was a feedlot once before that we actually purchased to remove um, from the city because we wanted to improve air quality, uh, particularly odor issues. And uh, it was also an area where there was a fair amount of sand and gravel. So we're mining out that site. All of these pieces of property that I'm showing you now had a, a part to play in this fairly complicated deal that we put together. In the process was, in under one year, we formulated this tax increment district. We approved a number of zoning amendments to this property that would allow uh, food processing to occur here. We dealt with the lime deposit removal. Uh, we secured state and economic development incentives. We approved industrial water bank incentives, and they were very creative. One of the things that we're going to be trying to adjudicate in this next year is the use of milk water. Um, in other words, normally you bring raw water to a project. We're actually saying the cows are bringing milk, which has a by as includes um, some water sort of service in that, and so can we find a way to adjudicate that. We'll be doing some um, work at the courts uh, in the next year to try that out. And we crafted three financial reimbursement and property purchase agreements between multiple parties to make this work. Here's the deal. Um, Laprino is going to build the first of a four-phase cheese and whey processing facility, and it will have, at minimum, 400,000 square feet to start and at least 800,000 uh, at end. They think maybe closer to 870,000 square feet. That is a huge, huge building. 262, or 260 new jobs with an estimated growth of up to 500 new jobs. Um, average company wages will be about $17 an hour. We wanted to find something that would be uh, equal to or greater than the state average. $143 million of building investment, just the building, with only the first phase. Um, as they build out, they think there'll be well over $550,000 uh, with that million dollars. $122 million worth of equipment in the first phase because it's a food plant. They do an awful lot of stainless steel and specialized equipment. Um, obviously, that adds value. And the first phase of construction will be complete and operational by 2012. Some of the incentives that we needed to do, the industrial water bank rates for raw water, also the willingness to file for the special uh, cow milk credits, uh, various water and sewer service considerations. We, used, uh, we waived a portion of our sales and use tax to help them come. Uh, we reimbursed certain site development costs. Um, that's where the tax increment uh, piece comes in. There are things that you can finance under tax increment financing um, under the state. So that money that we're going to be keeping um, from the collection of the new taxes will go to help reimburse them for site development costs. That includes such things as hazardous uh, materials removal. So that asbestos that's on the site is something that we can help them remove. That lime that's on the site, by the way, the um, initial bill to move the lime was about $8 million. It's not cheap to move that kind of stuff when you get lots of quantity of that. Um, we also take a, took a look at the additional site. You know, I pointed out the uh, site that uh, Urban Renewal Authority has that uh, we have doing the sand and gravel. They were concerned that they may not have enough acreage, even with 100 acres of the Western Sugar Facility, to do their lagoons. And so we've uh, got an option agreement for them to purchase 16 acres from Urban Renewal Authority across the street. And then, of course, as Larry mentioned, through upstate Colorado, um, they helped provide all those important state economic incentives. So what are the benefits to the community? One is there's no out-of-pocket city or urban renewal contributions. All of the incentives that we're providing are based on either reduced or fee fees or waivers or the reimbursement of the new tax increment uh, financing mechanism. So this is, if you will, kind of that closed loop. If you think about the new Belgium model about how they're trying to maintain all their services on site, that's a sort of what we're doing from an economic model. We're retaining the dollars that would be generated from the site to help generate the incentives to make it happen in the first place. 
an important, important part for us is an older portion of the community is revitalized. I cannot imagine how we could possibly see the redevelopment of this site with all its hazards on it, with the kind of building that was on there, and with what it would take to provide a new um, development there without these tax increment incentives. Again, sort of a self-help model of how that works. And we'll see the removal of environmental challenges. One thing that uh, was discovered is even after they uh, did all their um, environmental analysis on the site, had uh, removed all the asbestos off of the property that they were aware of, they found even more after they got done uh, dealing with the building. So you have to be ready to be real flexible with redevelopment projects, and that's one thing that we're looking at. Um, additional benefits are new jobs. We have the 143 million plus in new construction and ancillary benefits. One of the things that we hear about a lot is with a business of this size, we can expect that there's going to be other companies that will want to follow and be close to them as well. For example, with all the stainless steel manufacturing that they do on the site as part of their upgrades, they expect to put into the building every year after it's constructed another three to five million dollars a year in those kinds of uh, equipment upgrades. That's a phenomenal amount of reinvestment in, in that project. A lot of new agribusiness, which creates new and expanded markets. Obviously, to have uh, the ability to produce cheese, they're going to have to have milk. Have milk, we've got to have bigger herds. Uh, all, obviously, those herds are going to create other kinds of business opportunities in Well County. And we'll see improvement in the area-wide property values. In fact, as we talked to the county assessor, his estimate was that because of Loprino's establishment on the site, that we could see uh, taxes and property values increase even as far away as downtown, which is uh, at least a, a mile away. Economic impact to the area, uh, Laprino's investment of at least $270 million, again for the first phase, is estimated to provide economic benefits of uh, $325 plus million for the city of Greeley. This is over a 20-year life, uh, $4.8 billion to the county, and $10.1 billion to the state. This is so important and, and, again, one of those things that wouldn't have happened without the partnerships that Larry described. I want to take you through a real quick review of kind of what was on the site and what the economic development picture was initially. Uh, Western Sugar Belt it's built its facility in Greeley with the construction starting in 1900 and the factory opening in 1902. So again, this is that stack you're going to see throughout the pictures. Um, one thing they said is they were, I, I looked at a 1902 um, a newspaper where they had just opened up, they just finished, and they said they expected that this business would help many a farmer through the lean times because they were going to be able to produce a, a demand for a crop, the sugar beet crop. And um, they thought that it would be so successful that Greeley might grow to be as many as 8,000 people when it was all done. Um, did that just fine. Thank you. We're 93,000 right now. Um, this is sort of how farmers hauled the beets via the uh, to the plant via horse-drawn carriages in the early days. You can see them all lined up here um, in fashion to unload the beets. Uh, they had a pretty modern method, a hydraulic lift, to dump the beets at some point. These are centrifugals. Uh, this is an old stereoscope picture that you can see of what the factory looked like initially. Um, again, these are uh, workers working with those sugar centrifugals um, in the company. Western Sugar Workforce, uh, pretty uh, interesting group of characters here. Uh, they're sitting on, of course, the rail line here. Little guy bringing the lunch bucket. Uh, guys kind of on each other's shoulders. This was kind of what the workforce looked like. So I guess, Larry, as we talk about what, how important labor is, it's important <laughs> as we think about what we can do. This is a little hard to see, but I'm going to um, share with you a little bit about this uh, site plan. This is uh, First Avenue. This is Ash. This is that... Uh, where the river is. This is a very linear building um, from the standpoint of how it works. Trucks are going to be coming in on 13th. They're going to have a central point to drop off the milk. And then it goes through a very linear process with uh, going in as milk and coming out as cheese. And that's why the site was so important. This is an aerial perspective of what the building will look like. Again, north is up here with the river. This is Ash and this is First Avenue. Uh, trucks will be coming in the site at 13th, coming around, dropping off their products. Um, take a look at this stack right here. This is what will replace the 180-foot stack that was there. This is also 185 feet, um, so very similar, but it's going to be much closer to 16th Street, so it'll have a much more massive appearance. Um, the employee parking is all off to the east. As they build out their plant, these dark areas indicate how they're going to be completing um, to their ultimate phase of development. So they've really thought carefully through. As Larry said, they're a very deliberate plant, thinking about how multiple phases will work. Um, just to give you a size or scale, um, here's Larry right there, and here's the size of these buildings. Uh, this is a very enormous uh, scale of development. And just to give you one more perspective, this is the Pepsi Center. Uh, so in terms of math, we're not moving the Pepsi Center up here, but that might be an interesting economic development opportunity for us if we work pretty hard at it. Um, but just to give you a size of scale, we're talking about a building that in scale is very equivalent to the Pepsi Center. That is not insignificant for us in Greeley, Colorado at all. 
Um, on Friday, June the 13th, we uh, had our uh, announcement of them coming. They got to work right after that. Um, one thing I really want to point out is just, uh, again, emphasize what Larry said. This is one of those projects that doesn't happen without a lot, a lot of partners. And so we had the Greeley City Council that dealt with um, land use approvals, the Urban Renewal Authority that provided the bulk of the um, incentive program, Upstate Colorado, invaluable for its help with the incentives and coordinating much of the project, Water Board, Planning Commission, County Departments. I worked with the Assessor's Office and their Health Department regularly to uh, see what we could do to get past some of these issues of lime and other deposits. Aggregate Industries had to renegotiate their, our lease with them so that we could sell 16 acres to Loprino for that development. Waste Management helped us figure out how much lime they could take up at their uh, landfill if it came down to that. We have found another solution in the meantime. Uh, the Dairy Council, as well as all the folks in this community that uh, were a big part of making this happen. So we like to think of Greeley, um, which is great from the ground up, having a new great from the ground up kind of uh, partner that we can do that with. So with that, this is, I think, one of those stories that really helps us understand the importance, again, of recycling, redevelopment, making sure that our community is looking at all sorts of different ways to be sustainable in the way we build our community. And being able to take advantage of our older parts of town where we already have basic infrastructure, we already have utility systems and roads and water and sewer, and we have land that we need to figure out how to reuse. This is, I think, in a lot of ways, one of those stories about why redevelopment in particular is the first place we should look um, for new development opportunities, not necessarily the last piece. So with that, we have another interesting piece of this we'll share with uh, Larry. I mean, Bruce. Larry's had the opportunity to really talk to you about the early stages of economic development as they come about, and Becky has been able to tell you really about our present economic development activity, and what I really want to share with you is more of a dream about our future. And uh, uh, let me see if I can get my slides up to do that. It's a very short presentation, so you're going to see me speak a little bit more than show you slides. Bear with me while I go through this. How many people are very familiar with the Greeley, Weld County area? Can you just give me a show of hands? Okay, excellent. Um, let me share with you a little bit of my background. As many of you saw, I have a degree in social and political economics, so probably no surprise to you that I'm a big believer in what I often term as cultural geography. Cultural geography in the, in the sense that I really believe that solid economic development occurs as a result of combining an area's culture with their geographic resources of significance. And if you're familiar with Greeley in the Weld County area, as Larry mentioned, there's a significant amount of agricultural resources or agribusiness within the community. And so as a result of the Latrino, Latrino project, we're starting to build a dream. We're building a dream about how we can combine agribusiness with emerging clean energy technology. Now, in case you're not convinced, let me share with you a couple things as Larry already did. Weld County is the eighth largest agricultural producer in the United States. Now, that may not sound like much, but that is significant. As Larry mentioned, all others within the top ten are in California. And that is a significant amount of resource capacity in Weld County and in Greeley as the center of that economic activity. And many of you witnessed that. You probably see the presence of JBS Swift, and you see the presence of Loprino Food, perhaps not yet, but you will at some point in time. Meadow Gold the Dairy Farmers of America, okay, Agland, and the list of companies go on. All of them participating in a very significant, large, and broad agricultural product stream of inputs and outputs that result in a significant amount of biomass, machinery, and capital, which all lend themselves to taking the expertise of culture and geography in this area and emerging it with a clean energy industry that we're seeing in northern Colorado. Now, why is this coming about? It's coming about for many reasons. First and foremost, we have a very solid academic foundation to help support the merger of these two elements. This UNC Sustainability Forum is evidence of it. Uh, UNC also has a very uh, well-adept and trained biology faculty that is going to help us in defining what sustainability is in our cultural context. We have at Colorado State University a significant amount of faculty that are, are associated with clean energy technology. 
And then we have the clean energy cluster, which is an association of all those elements, providing a significant amount of academic-based knowledge for bringing this new science together. The industry, as Larry mentioned, is really coming together in northern Colorado, and he's talked to you about the solar and the wind and the uh, biofuel firms that are here. And as you uh, will know, that we will also begin to see some of those working within biomass. I don't know if you pay attention to the headlines, but if you did, you probably saw that XL Energy signed a long-term energy purchase lease with a company called MicroG which is a real leader in anaerobic digestion, the very method technology that you saw New Belgium using. Okay? Um, not only that, but in our state and nationally, we have a significant movement in the form of governance, right? In talking about clean energy and its imperative for our future. And then, of course, businesses are beginning to adapt to the notion of the triple bottom line. It's significant and it's important in using its natural, its human, and its financial capital in sustainable manners and forms. So what does our future look like here? What is the foundation that we're hoping to establish here as we build forward this dream? Well, I certainly want to put it on a solid foundation of technology transfer. Talked about the importance of academia in that process. And so it's a matter of taking the agriculture and energy sciences that are pretty predominant in our two northern Colorado universities and then moving into a design and development phase with those. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but this is kind of an interesting philosophical discussion I'd like to have later on about the difference between creative destruction and creative destruction. And our goal will be to actually create through this process tangible elements and items, right? Sort of opposite to the creation of, if you will, credit default swaps, very intangible in nature, which are within that league of the second common, I'd say. Um, why do we want to do this? Is because we really want to do this as an economic development initiative to really create competitive advantage. Now, I'll talk a little bit later about that, but what we're trying to do is to really improve energy efficiency, trying to reduce energy costs associated with our major employers in our community, to help them in capturing the complete value stream of the work and activity that they do, and of course as a cluster to come together to create a significant element of knowledge, a body that's capable of really creating advantage in, uh, in clean energy technology. So what do I mean when I talk about the uh, Greeley's Clean Energy Park? Uh, once again, it's a matter of combining agribusiness and energy into a clean energy cluster. Now, we are so fortunate to be able to do this because of our Western Sugar Tax Increment Financing District. We're talking about a technology that will truly benefit from the assistance of public-private partnerships. And as, ben she, as be Betsy showed you, Becky showed you, can I have some water? Tax increment financing allows us to actually capture, not new taxes, but the existing tax stream and to partner with public-private entities to create, for example, a new clean energy plant based upon the waste streams from Laprino. You saw the size of that plant. That will be a huge waste stream product with JBS, which is north of that, and with our own municipal waste sludge services, which are right in the middle of those two geographic areas. Um, we received, thanks to the governor's energy office, a new energy economic development grant. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. Um, this energy park is intended to be not just a association of independent industries, but it's really intended to be an association of cooperative or collaborative industries that will share their knowledge in terms of taking traditional agribusiness, traditional industry, and combining it with um, new clean energy technology. Okay? Now, um, we're going to go through this by developing an understanding of sustainability within the community. We're going to participate in techno-economic modeling business model adaptation, and I don't know where you are philosophically or politically on the issue of carbon credits, but throw that aside for the moment and just simply realize that they will play into our future and they will play into this project. All right, let me focus here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we received from the Governor's Energy Office a new Energy Economic Development Grant, and we're kicking that off this week. 
it has three major tasks in it. The first task is to conduct what we call a technical evaluation of waste to energy technologies. And we're going to value within the anaerobic digestion technology field the full spectrum of capabilities. Now, it may look like a pretty simple science, but it's rather interesting. Once you begin an anaerobic digestion process, as I understand, the microbes get very picky about their food diet and their food stream in order to maximize their biological uh, methane production potential, which is the second piece of this. We'll be working with a Dr. Charvel at CSU. Uh, she will go and collect potential waste stream sources from JBS, Leprino, the dairies in our area, take it back to the laboratory over a series of eight weeks with a series of different sample bodies. We'll go ahead and in a small anaerobic digestion lab actually create a very, few, a very fair or accurate assessment of the total potential methane that can be produced as a result of those waste streams, which then go into our task number three piece, which is much deeper and much broader, and that's the more significant techno-economic modeling component of it, in which we will look at all of the capital resources required to do it. We will look at all of the transportation schema associated with bringing those resources into a central location. We will look at the capital financing costs associated with it. We'll look at sistering other like energy technologies associated with that. And we will come forward with what would be an optimal investment or plant size in order to actually make clean and renewable energy a reality within the clean energy park. And the purpose in doing it is to really take and to help firms like JBS and Leprino <coughs> capture value off of their waste stream reduce the energy costs associating with doing business in the Greeley area and community, and providing competitive advantage for the attraction of new firms in agribusiness and energy as we move forward on those principles and the principle of creating a solid and strong energy cluster. Okay, um, That first task should be finished in June. The second task will be finished in July. Task three is scheduled to finish in September. We'll compile all of that into a report that will go back to the state to help inform other such projects in the community, in the nation, and in the world. Okay? And then, of course, we'll make it widely available to our community and all the businesses associated with it. So simply stated, I just encourage all of you to really come join the dream. It is um, really hopefully what will be the end of a lot of hard work begun by upstate Colorado and their economic development efforts with Becky Safrick and her wonderful community development team and their work with Leprino Foods. That's it. I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? For anybody here? Please. Yeah, we should. I know, uh, I think that after this is a little get-together after, after this is done. And so I've got to run away back to the office, but my plan is to come back and be available to really talk about that. It's pretty boring unless you're into it. Lou? You know, since we just talked about Sprino and making cheese, we can imagine what the biomass is. What, what are other sorts of biomass? Well, JBS Swift, we talked about, Leprino, we talked about, and the Dairy Farmers of America, which are really that broader conglomeration of all the dairy herds in northern Colorado. Um, I didn't mention that we have selected the firm to do this work. It's a partnership between Symbios and Stewart Environmental, and Stewart Environmental was the recipient of an ACRE grant. I think, Forbes, you're going to come up and not talk about that, but talk about some other things. And they really identified three centers in which there is a significant density of dairy herds. Greeley happens to be one of them. The other one is an area around Platteville. It's no surprise that Microgy entered into an agreement with XL Energy for the production of methane, directly fed via pipeline into that plant. Okay. Um, there are also other unique sources, Lou, believe it or not. I got into a conversation the other day with Dean Anderson, who does Anderson Salvage, sort of the old traditional junkyard. He now takes his vehicles, and after they have been stripped from every valuable part, being recycled into a sustainable another, another vehicle of 20 years of age, he is putting them through a shredder, a shredder that's actually capable of bringing that down to a molecular level through like this 
mass bombardization of microwaves and create a biofuel out of it. Who'd have thought that? So it's things like that. It's those sort of technologies when I talked about trying to sister new thoughts or new, new elements to it. So I had a question over here. Great. The, um, the lime is uh, not, as I said, toxic, so, but it's got really high amounts of calcium in it. Um, so we've got 700,000 cubic yards of the lime on the site and nowhere to necessarily take it to. So the original thought was if we had to truck it all up to a waste treatment facility like a, a waste management area, again, it would be all the diesel to get it up there. It would be having to store it. It has to be in a place where they don't have any leaches or leaching of the – leaches might be good, um, but leaching not. <laughs> um, so, what they, so what happened? And as a result of that is as we kept trying to figure out what could be done with it, um, it so happens that they found a person who has a site just north of 8th Street that can be mined out. It's just a, it's a large area that's just dirt right now. So they're actually going to remix all the soil and um, take the soil, basically excavate the site north of 8th Street, bring it over to the empty Laprino site right now since the buildings have all been taken down, take the lime and mix it with that at a proportion that would allow it to be reused not only for construction fill material, which is what they're going to put about 300,000 cubic yards back on the site, but the rest they'll haul back over to the excavated out area, put the dirt back in there. It'll elevate it um, a few extra feet, but then they'll make that available as construction fill material as well. It's a great, it's a great process and it was one that it's kind of that mother of necessity. This, there's got to be a better way than to take this and put it in the landfill. Um, the company that's doing this is an environmental agency that's also taken asbestos and fly ash and mixed that with materials to create um, new road base. And um, they've done that with other facilities around um, the community. So if you're ever driving around and have seen old uh, Western Sugar facilities around the landscape of Colorado, you will be able to, all of you in this room now, see right next to those facilities these large piles of what looks like dirt with sort of a white encrustation on it, and that's really just a lime byproduct. Um, nobody really knows very much what to do with it. And it's a funny material because if you stand on it, you start to sink a little bit. It's, it's very much like talc powder, um, so it's just real soft and it's not suitable for just basic construction. It's also very good for, um, if you could mix it with enough manure or other kind of uh, waste product, it would be a, a find uh, use on fields and in this area we do a lot of um, sludge applications onto fields um, as a way to treat our or to uh, get rid of some of our waste uh, water treatment byproducts um, and I think this goes back to something that the New Belgium folks said is you have to rethink byproduct and that's what Bruce is talking about too if you consider all the things that we manufacture produce create in this world there's usually a byproduct that goes with that and if you can think about what that byproduct could be used for whey is a byproduct of course of um, cheese production Production. Well, the Leprino folks are using a good portion of that way in baby formulas and other kinds of products. But there's also energy that's being created. So if the waste that's coming from the material that's going to now be put into their lagoons and their wastewater treatment plant can be captured and used, as Bruce said, in a waste waste to energy facility that uses JBS Swift Waste, City of Greeley Wastewater Treatment Plant, um, the wave facilities, and its potential. There may be other waste products that could be used to create a renewable source that doesn't create new energy to create as much as capture waste products and convert them to another means. So that's what we're up to. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? All right. Thanks very much. This afternoon, I'd like to uh, introduce Forbes Guthrie with Stewart Environmental Consultants, who will start us off, and Greg Jones with the P3 Futures Group, who will then pick up the baton and carry it forward, and we'll see how they uh, hand things back and forth after that. But it gives me a great pleasure at this point to uh, introduce Forbes Guthrie. My name is Forbes Guthrie. I take care of the strategic initiatives as well as our key client interaction at Stewart Environmental. One of the uh, tenets that I want to convey today is, is, as part of our presentation, we want to bring all of this together. Um, Lynn Kurowski did a great job of, of, of engineering how this um, would work. He built the stage. As we drill down this afternoon, we're going to start getting to where, you know, what can I do? 
you know, as, as a small business, small medium-sized business person, what can I do? How much is it going to cost? What's the bottom line? And that's what I'm going to attempt to do with Greg today. So just to give you a little bit of framework, um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the major stakeholders and governments um, in Colorado, particularly in northern Colorado and recently with the city of Greeley. In doing that, we uh, got introduced to the Montford College of Business and the Montford Institute, and we got to know Lynn and, and his crew. And as we were talking about six to eight months ago, we were working through the objectives of, of this forum. And one of the things I mentioned, I said, you know, one of the things that we need to talk about is, is lead and high performance buildings. And at Sturt Environmental, we're actually on the supply side of the renewable energy business. You know, we do a lot of work in innovative engineering for energy and water and in biomass and in water resources. And so we're on the supply side. So I said, certainly we, we can do that. Um, Dave Stewart, who is um, our CEO, um, gives classes all around the United States. Um, and he works with RMI, as well as a number of other people, um, to do sustainability forums. And so I talked to Dave, and I said, Dave, um, we've been, been invited to uh, you know, do, a, do a talk on sustainability in high-performance buildings. So that was great. Lo and behold, he got called off to Congress to speak before Congress today on sustainability. So I thought, well, because I only know really the supply side of, of the equation, who can I get? And so I, I, I went back and I said, well, I know the perfect person. His name is Greg Jones. Um, I got to know Greg uh, through a company called Porter Industries, a uh, green cleaning company over in, in uh, Loveland. Greg also, though, most notably started the Northern Colorado chapter of the USGBC. So you guys know, or may know, USGBC really is the behind the lead standards of, of high performance buildings. And so with that, what Greg and I did was we attempted to put a lot of these concepts together into really, as a business owner, what do I need to do? How much is it going to cost? And really, what sense does it make to do these initiatives? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Greg. Greg's going to talk through a lot of the structure of the LEED certifications and so on as, as actually a guideline for what you can do to follow. After that, though, what we're going to do is go through some real-life examples. And that may spur you to say, OK, wow, I can do that. And if I do collaboration, there's a lot of under undercurrents that we've heard today. If I do collaboration, we can give it farther. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Greg. Good afternoon. I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, taking time out of your day uh, to come and see what's, what's going on with sustainability, especially over in this part of northern Colorado. I want to thank Forbes for inviting me to uh, come in and share any of the knowledge that I can uh, with you. And I want to thank uh, UNC for sponsoring this conference. Um, P3 Futures Group is, is basically, P3 is the people, planet, and profit that you've been hearing about. And obviously, companies need to earn a profit or else they're not going to be uh, very sustainable and not be around. And of course, in today's environment, um, sorry about that, but in today's world, uh, anybody that uses recycled paper is now a uh, environmentalist or a green company, so that kind of goes by the wayside. And uh, the most important aspect to me is the people. That's that's all of us. We're either the customer, the client, the CEO, whatever, and, and we're the drivers of the whole thing, and that's why we're doing this, is to uh, help put it all together. So what the, the aspect of what I do is try to work within companies to find some of the hidden money uh, that's available, which a lot of companies are finding now by a lot of the cutbacks that they've been doing. It's certainly there and it's available. And then take that money and reinvest in the company, whether it's through uh, good quality marketing or through uh, more uh, environmental initiatives. And of course, since we're not doing that today, we're doing it in the future. So that's how we came up with P3 Futures Group. Um, before we get started, there's there's a couple different ways of looking at companies and how they're how they're approaching a lot of this uh, process. 
The first thing is you can look at your mission just like, uh, say, New Belgium has been doing, and everything they do and they touch has to do with sustainability, whether it's their building or their process, their supply chain or anything else. And um, I'm here to tell you that I'm doing my best to support uh, New Belgium uh, every, every Friday and Saturday night that I can. So just wanted to pass that on. Secondly, um, you can do it through your product or your service, and a lot of, a lot of companies you know, are starting uh, with that through their, their packaging or the process, uh, their supply chain or their vendors or their fleet. And then the uh, final way you can do it is through the brick and mortar, the actual building uh, that you're in. And that's what we wanted to talk about today is, is the green building part of it. Um, USGBC, U.S. Green Building Council, is a nonprofit organization. They have probably just under 20,000 members. And it gets a little complicated on how you do that because you cannot be a local member. You have to be a national member. And um, it's based on the amount of uh, income or revenue that you have as a company of how much um, it costs to become a member there. They are the drivers behind the LEED, L-E-E-D, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and it hit me about two weeks ago about that design part that I want to talk about in a minute. But there's different components about the green building, and then there's the cost-benefit um, ratio that needs to be considered. The green building components, uh, some are all of them. Do you want to go full tilt and become a certified green building? Well, there's certainly advantages to doing that, or at the very least of just doing something like changing out uh, to fluorescent, you know, compact fluorescent bulbs will make, it, will make a difference. And we wanted to try and give you a point of reference of where, where those are. And then, of course, the energy uh, and indoor air quality are probably two of the lowest hanging fruit items uh, that you can get your hands around and do something and decide how much further you want to go with the process. And then, like Forbes said, we'll get into some case studies, some actual uh, dollars to put with the project. Okay. So the first thing, you look, at your green, you look at your building, you look at your status, and you hear all of these wonderful ideas. Gosh, um, development of a long-term asset. If you look at a building, it's probably going to be around 30, 50 years, so you might as well make it as, as efficient as you can by using as uh, local materials as you can and do that entire process. Uh, you want to have lowered operating costs. This is one of the things that, that if I were to get on a soap stand about, it's in reality, probably only a handful of us will even be involved in the design or building of a new building, either with our company or even, even in our industry, unless you make it a point of that's what you're going to do. Um, realistically, the rest of us are already in our buildings. So how do you make that a green building? Well, the USGBC has a lot of different categories, and the two most popular ones are certainly the new construction or NC or the existing building which is the EB and some of the examples I'm going to show here are kind of generic uh, and interrelated on how they how they score points and some of the different categories so I don't want to get too confused about you know which ones back and forth but the lowered operating costs certainly operating costs have little to do with a new construction but it's how it's designed and built which will create those costs over the course of the next 30 to 50 years of that uh, building existence, maybe even 100 years. Lower risk and liability. If you have a green building, it's a well-managed or hopefully a better managed building. You have uh, improved worker productivity and of course uh, that's probably our largest asset with any company is, is our employees and if they're motivated and they're in a green building and they're feeling good about the company, then they're going to have a uh, higher re rate of return. Uh, win and retain uh, employees uh, or attract and retain them, uh, winning contracts. You know, there's going to come a point, just like ISO did to us, that some businesses will not do business with you if you are not ISO certified. It's getting that same way with, uh, with sustainability and green building and, you know, whatever else that we're doing uh, in that regard. And, of course, the marketability. We are a green company if we have a certified green building. Okay. Simply, what is a green building? According to the LEED program, you basically have five different categories in which you can score points. First is uh, the site planning, the second one going counterclockwise, indoor environmental quality, material use, energy, and of course water management. Now if you're going to design a building, if you're going to start from scratch, 
the biggest bang for the buck, the best way to get the biggest return on anything you're going to do in that new construction is before you even select a site, before you even put a pencil to it, is to get a charrette together, which is a team that you've heard about earlier today of, of the different um, disciplines and all start talking together. And highly recommend to you that you don't even consider money at this point. Don't consider how much money it's going to cost, how much you're going to save, or anything like that. It's just put your pie in the sky picture together and start from there. And then start looking at what makes the most sense in that building. And then get back down to reality and say, okay, we can't have this 100%, but we can have this 82%. Just like they were talking about the energy savings. They weren't going to, they weren't going to uh, settle at 12%, and they certainly weren't going to go up to 50%. So they kind of compromised and came out at 38%. Best way to do that is do not think of dollars at that point in time. USGBC is a collaboration of a lot of different um, disciplines, and they like to believe that they're uh, in charge of a lot of different aspects of it, which is kind of hard to encompass everything and try to corral the thing. But if you look at their history, they're probably not quite 20 years old. Uh, to have 20,000 members nationally, to have thousands of buildings that have followed this, to have it as a, uh, a standard with a lot of uh, federal governments and uh, municipalities, that this is the definition of a green building. Uh, they're stewards, stewards of the market transformation. They have great education programs. Um, they're always in flux. They're always learning different ways of how to do stuff. They have great forums. Uh, they do build community, and they do have a lot of tools um, and uh, different expertise. Just go to their website and you can spend the other part of those 60 hours of your education uh, learning about USGBC and green building. Okay, now if you look at this, this is what one of the hardest parts for me uh, when we were starting the, the branch chapter up here was to try and put on educational programs that would get everybody's attention. We just decided it was impossible so we would concentrate on the different different aspects of it. You have building owners, you have uh, planners, you have schedulers, prof, uh, property managers, you have everybody involved with this process. And then you start thinking, well, that's, that's kind of a good thing if you can get everybody together and work, work on it. When Forbes and I were putting this together, um, we thought the federal, local, state governments and the, uh, the code officials are probably the most important people to get involved and get, um, get active with this because you have such conflicts. Some of the things that don't make sense. One of the ones that I love the best is the uh, water rights in Colorado where the, a lot of the water originates but we can't keep it here. But a lot of the other states get to do and save you know, rainwater. Just as an example of, of the different conflicts of interest. Okay, leadership in energy and environmental design. It is the leading edge system for certifying the greenest performance buildings in the world. It is by far taking the lead of what a green building definition is. But that last word, design, is probably what I have um, the hardest time with. It's about design. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the new building and how it's put together. It's critical. You've got one shot of doing this, so it's very important that it is designed properly. So it takes a uh, collaborative effort with everybody in there. But it doesn't, it hasn't in the past. It's getting better at talking about the existing building or the operations and maintenance of it. Okay, if you look at the uh, complete life cycle of the building, again, you can get your uh, building in a lot of different categories certified, whether it's a home, a neighborhood development, commercial interior, corn shell, new construction. Even uh, They even have programs now for schools, health care, and retail. And then if you look over on the right, that's really faded out with the orange, uh, mine's orange, I don't know why it shows up yellow here, but uh, existing buildings and operations and maintenance. Again, that building's going to be around for a long time, so it has to be uh, properly run, properly operated. Um, probably, if you look at the total cost of buildings, uh, your design bill is about 11%. The financing is around 14%. I mean, I'm talking the life cycle of the building. And probably about 75% of the cost of that building is going to be in, in the operations and maintenance over the life cycle of that building. So that's going to be the important part of it. Okay, LEED. USGBC has four levels of LEED. Um, they have certified, silver, gold, and platinum. And to give you an example, that's the kind of um, a points category uh, that you get. So 
I'll talk in, in a minute about how to get to those points. Those categories I was telling you about, sustainable site, water efficiency, energy atmosphere, materials, and uh, indoor environmental quality, and of course they have an innovative uh, innovation and operations. That's for everything else that doesn't fit in there that they haven't been able to uh, figure out how to fit in there. You can, you can make a case for uh, an additional point or two and put it into that program. But again, it's limited. It, it, uh, the ceiling on that is seven points. Impacts of uh, US, uh, U.S. buildings on resources. When you talk about cars and you think about pollution and everything, you're, you're only talking about 15, maybe 18 percent of carbon emissions. When you're looking at um, buildings, you're looking at almost 40 percent comes off of the energy and the creating the energy for those buildings. Buildings, 40% um, of primary energy use, 72% of electricity consumption, and 13% of uh, water consumption. That's just in the buildings alone. And if you look at those new buildings, there's, by comparison, a handful of new buildings uh, in the area getting built. And across the country, there's about 5 million commercial buildings uh, in the US. Anybody want to take a guess at the average size commercial building no guesses? How about eight to 10,000 square feet? How many of you are not in a building that is eight to 10,000 square feet? There you go, a few of you. So you can see that it's, it's just like a great big house. Well, for most of us, it's a great big house to have eight to 10,000 square feet. And it doesn't have a lot, of, um, a lot of consumption in it, but when you put five million of them together, you have a lot of, a lot of buildings to uh, work with. So green buildings, on the plus side, can reduce energy uh, use consumption up to 50%. They can reduce the CO2 emissions, the water use, and certainly the solid waste. Uh, perceived be uh, business benefits. Why would you want to go and go uh, go to a green building? Well, again, if if you're a building owner or if you're a building tenant that's paying rent, um, eight to nine percent operating cost decreases. And again, you need if you're the tenant, you need to be able to negotiate that with the owner. Uh, the, if you're the owner and the ba uh, building value increases and any uh, return on investment on any of the improvements that you do, it would certainly make a lot of sense to consider if you want to go to a green building. Who's doing it? Who's around the country right now? This is a total uh, state by state of certified and registered buildings. You can see Colorado is um, probably certainly in the upper half of the mix at 347 buildings. And this was of uh, May of last year, so almost a year old. But they're not far behind uh, big leaders like California and Washington. So there's certainly a lot of, um, a lot of attention being drawn to a certified uh, building. Now the evaluation process. This would be the next step. I mean, you saw all those, those and uh, the reason to pursue this, it sure makes a lot of sense. Well, why isn't everybody just jumping out there and doing those things? Well, if you look at it, internally and externally, there's a lack of industry knowledge and skills. We don't know all of these different disciplines, and I, don't, I have yet to meet anybody that knows everything about it. Uh, there's some that know quite a bit, but there's certainly a lot of other experts out there. So it's a collaboration uh, with a lot of different people. Within the company itself, there's a lack of uh, knowledge sharing. Finance may say, oh, this will be a capital cost. We can't do this. So they're in conflict with uh, the marketing campaign that's, that's coming up. So there may not be the money involved. There may be split incentives. There may be a reason to stay in this building versus um, building a new building someplace else. There's going to certainly be increased capital costs. Uh, there's outdated valuation techniques, whether it's underwriting, whether it's insurance, or whether it's just even the appraisal. Uh, the Green Building uh, Conference that's once a year, they started out probably with about four to 5,000 people. I think in about five years' time, they had probably close to 30,000 people at the, last, uh, at the last conference. The one they had in Denver, they had a whole track of workshops and discussions that had nothing to do other than just real estate uh, adjust uh, evaluations. So these guys are starting to realize uh, the value of green building. Okay, so you put together the team, whether it's an internal team or whether it's external team, whether it's experts, whether it's somebody that's going to facilitate for you, somebody that's uh, going to give you the outside advice, somebody that's going to be a, a part of your performance contractor. And then you want to start looking at your prerequisites and your first pass at your points of the level that you want to achieve. 
Now your prerequisites, um, when you do this and you try to get those points, you have to come up with, I think it's like seven or nine prerequisites in whatever program you're going go to go for. And if you do not meet those prerequisites, you have to make a decision. That's a definite uh, go, no go point uh, in your process. If you do not want to put the money into that process, you will never, ever become a LEED certified building. That's where you need to make the assessment, okay, how much is it going to cost to obtain those prerequisites? Once you do that, and this is through the rating system here, um, then you can decide where you're going to go. Uh, some of the tools that are available in the rating system, uh, these are all available through USGBC, and if you're a member, you get a discounted price for those. If you don't, then you can start spending some more money on obtaining a reference guide. Uh, the project checklist is available for free. The CIRs, those, that's my favorite one, the credit interpretation request. If it's not listed in that book and you think it is a uh, sustainable or a green item, you can send it along with a check for $200, I believe it is, and they'll review it for you and say, yes, that's okay to do. Uh, you can go online. Uh, there's LEAD online. You can certainly attend certainly uh, all kinds of educational workshops that are offered through USGBC and through independent uh, independent sources and you can look up uh, case studies and we'll have a couple of them listed here for yourself. Their website uh, is usgbc.org. Feel free to take a look and uh, see where you want to go with their tools. On the um, two of the different, two of the categories what we want to talk to, and I didn't want to spend all day going through every one of these, but on energy and atmosphere is the probably the, the, the biggest opportunity is in energy savings and with all of the different opportunities now um, you can you can score pretty good well what's that score look like well if you go to energy star and you take your last year or the last 12 months energy and that's natural gas uh, electric whatever you're using energy star has a uh, calculator you plug in those numbers and you can see what your score is. It used to be that they would accept 50% was the minimum. Now I believe it's like 65. You have to score 65 with a high of 100. And the higher you get, the more points you're eligible for. So at 65, you can receive one or two points, but you meet that prerequisite, which is, which is critical. And if you get a higher ranking of up to, like, say, 98 to 100, you can pick up 15 points, whereas you can see about uh, two of those grids uh, down below optimize energy efficiency performance yes uh, you have to you have to meet the prerequisites so you're going to meet uh, some of the points there it's how much you want to do then you can decide okay do I want to go further with these points by doing more insulation or whatever and that's where you start investing some of the cost in retrofitting uh, your building do you want to increase your um, your energy performance uh, we wanted to talk about uh, commissioning one of the one of the probably most forgotten or neglected parts of a new building and a turnover is was the building commissioned now if you have a new building you have uh, typically a one-year warranty with that and how do you know where you stand with the, with the process did somebody walk through and check all the lights did they check all of the uh, check all of the uh, HVAC units a quick story <laughs> when uh, uh, Ken Sargent and I were trying to do the commissioning of our building it has three uh, units in the in the subfloor and so he was with the walkie-talkie up on the top and I don't know why I was on the bottom because uh, it was in a crawl space but anyways the units the fuse box were numbered one two and three and the units were numbered one two and three so we were up there confirming that and he was flicking off unit one and unit three was going off and I thought he was being funny and it was it was it was not marked properly so that was one thing that we found the second thing we found was that the uh, the uh, ignition the electronic ignition wasn't working on unit number two no telling how long that had been out so two of those units were working overtime to compensate for that third one so obviously we were spending more energy plus we were um, uh, wearing out those other units so it's, it's a good idea to commission even if you're not going to go for a green building um, we won't get into the renewable uh, the renewables you've heard a lot about that but you can certainly get points if you have wind power or other on-site type of regeneration and your energy performance contracting I don't know if uh, Forbes you're going to address some of that but um, there are certainly ways to finance in, in uh, enhancing or re 
renewing your uh, your HVAC system or some of your energy systems. Okay, indoor air quality. This is another checklist. Remember, there's five categories here. This is the second one. You have to have for your prerequisites an outdoor air introduction and an exhaust system. What that basically means is you have to prove that you have enough fresh air coming in for your employees. And it's based on a ratio of how many employees you have and how many square feet and how much your air changes are within the building. Um, that one's a little bit tough but not impossible. And uh, again, in the Porter building, if we, we had to go get some blowers to, to bring in more fresh air. And we thought, well, geez, that's creating more energy to provide more fresh air. So we had called uh, USGBC reviewers, and they said, well, we understand that, but for the small trade-off, it's more important to have fresh air in the building. So it was more concerned about the employees within the building. Uh, the environmental uh, tobacco smoke, we thought that's pretty easy because anybody that smokes are outside anyways. Well, you have to write the procedure, you have to train everybody on it, and then you have to have it signed off that this is, this is in effect. Then you have to post signs around the building. You cannot allow smoking within 25 feet of any entryway, any operable window, or any air intake. And you have to provide a smoking area outside. But that wasn't, that wasn't so difficult, so that was very minimal. And then a green cleaning policy. This is new on the uh, existing building policy. And it talks about um, how you do your cleaning. And then there's a whole list, and you can get almost nine points. And that was one of the reasons why Porter went for this, because there was a green cleaning company. It made sense that they could do this and uh, help, help other companies get involved with the green cleaning, cleaning program. OK, now, this is the moment of truth. You can do all this stuff. You can talk philosophically about it. But is it worth the costs or the savings? To this, I would say it really depends on who you are as a company and what you're trying to accomplish. Is it part of your sustainability program? Is it part of uh, who you want to be and where you're going? Uh, I would highly recommend researching um, what a green building is and what it means to you. You have to be able to do some of the modeling and say, is this, is this going to be worthwhile? Can I meet this? A great example, you saw Fossil Ridge High School. Uh, saved ninety thousand dollars. You cannot believe how how lucky that was. Fort Collins High School was built in 1994. About two miles down the road, another almost identical type of high school, same type of usage, in the same type of region, in the same type of environment, and that's what they compared it to. And they said, "Geez, in ten years' time, we figured out that we can be that much better and more efficient on building, designing, and building a green building, and coming up with a hundred thousand dollar savings." My math's right, in 10 years, that's about a million dollars for the school district that they can spend someplace else. Um, the cost of doing business, is it important to you to have a green building, to be known as a sustainable company? Um, and how do you treat your costs? Is it an investment? Is it an expense? How do you, how do you work that? So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Forbes, going to go into some case studies and more specifics to try and make a little bit more sense uh, to what I was telling you on a, on a more hypothetical level there. So thanks, Greg. Greg did a lot better job than I could. Um, I can't quite become an expert reading it on the internet. So thanks. Um, what I want to do is bring this together and say, okay, as a small to medium-sized business owner, what does this mean to me? And the best way to do that is through examples of case studies. And so through IFMA, IFMA has a plethora of data on, on these type of initiatives. So one of them is Wells Fargo. Since uh, May 2007, Wells Fargo has doubled its commitments for lead buildings from $1 billion to $2 billion. It's increased the number of lead buildings it's financed by 125% and expanded its reach on financing to lead certified buildings in 11 states and District Columbia in 19 states. So the benefits of uh, the certification, though, are essentially insurance companies um, recognize there's a profound value proposition for the customers. So if, if, the, end, if the building is higher performance, um, if, if the building is longer, lasting on the building envelope, it's, it's a higher performance building in the end economically for the customers, which is a big deal if you're an insurance company insuring that building. 
it redefines the risk for the business. If you're increasing your, your air exchanges inside the building dramatically, if you're increasing your employee comfort and safety as part of high performance building, um, that's of great value. So in a generality, buildings that are green are better risks. Now again, you don't have to be LEED Gold Platinum certified, but the LEED standards are actually a great model um, to, to model your initiatives after. So real estate ass assessment. Um, certified green, O&M, management, renovations, and, and recertification are all part of, of the LEED process. Again, as part of um, your analysis is what I do as a daily business, what I want to get out of this, how much do I have to spend on it. It really is an internal discussion, and it's just a discussion that you can have with a number of people through the industries um, like BOMA, IFMA, and then experts like, like Greg. So here's some case studies. Um, I met Greg when he was working at Porter Industries before he had P3 Futures. And we've been doing some air analysis through our laboratory with Porter Industries. And Porter Industries um, is an innovative green cleaning company over in, in Loveland, Colorado. There aren't a whole lot of green cleaning companies. A lot of cleaning companies, um, again, bringing some of these undercurrents um, back, back to uh, the discussion today. A lot, of green, a lot of cleaning companies use business as usual. You know, so the... the uh, the same cleaning operations have worked for years to years to years. It works. It's not broken. Well, there's better ways to do it. There's safer ways to do it. There's ways to do it that are less um, harmful to the environment, less harmful to employees, increase employee um, comfort levels as well, and so on and so on. Well, Port Industries, is, as part of their initiative, um, particularly on the marketing side first, um, they decided, well, Let's become a green cleaning company. So in order to do that, they said, uh, what do we need to do? Well, they looked at the, the LEED certification standards and said, OK, well, if we're going to talk the talk, we're going to walk the walk. So they started looking down the, the criterion list and said, OK, well, we can do this. So as part of their business development, Greg got to know all the LEED certifications. He actually is a, a LEED AP certified right now. And they wanted to lead by example. So in doing this, um, Greg was learning how to walk the walk and so on. And in addition, after he learned how to walk the walk, he, he developed a new consulting stream. Um, so that's actually how his new business came about of P3 Futures. In addition, though, the Porter Industries building increased in value um, by making some incremental changes in their building and also documenting them. Um, their value of their building went up, which was excellent. And then the energy savings as well. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how much you've documented it, but I do have some documentations of some very large initiatives um, as well. So it was a great learning process. Um, they demonstrated a, a commitment to sustainability by working through the, the lead structure. And most importantly, though, um, whether it's, it's cleaning, environmental engineering, Whatever you're doing, um, business as usual, as we found out, may not work optimally. You know, it, it's, it's collaboration. It's working together. A systems approach, talking to other people who may have a different viewpoint, works. And so the holistic approach to green cleaning um, really worked from the people business and environmental and the challenge all came together to say, okay, we're going to do this different. We're going to make a business model out of it. And it's quite successful. So one of, one of the companies that, that Porter worked with that, that I got to know because I actually had to go through their MSDS chemical analysis um, is Johnson Diversity. They make green chemicals. And one of their initiatives, they had the same initiative as Porter Industries. They said, OK, if we're going to make green chemicals, well, we might as well walk the walk. So they decided to become LEED certified. And in doing so, though, their annual energy cost savings was $90,000 per year. And that's a big deal. They also had 32% water savings, and their waste version was 49%. And so in doing that, that's a big deal. But it all comes down to cost benefits, so how much you have to spend to, to get all this stuff. 
So they've got a, a building floor space of, of a little bit over 250,000 square feet. Their initial implementation cost was only $73,000, roughly. The per square foot cost of that was 27 cents per square foot. But their annual net savings is staggering. Staggering is probably a light word. $137,000. So you can see that their ROI was less than a half a year. And that's big. So in looking through the lead standards and, and, and all of the check boxes, it's just a matter of, of, of getting the low-hanging fruit, saying, okay, what's best for us as, as a company? Maybe I want to you know, go for the gusto and get lead gold certified, or maybe I just don't want to do it all. And it's just a, it's a matter of you know, what the business is all about. So as, as part of what I do with Stewart Environmental, I'm also involved in Fort Collins um, and what we do in, in our initiatives um, within the city. I was involved with the Fort Z initiative, which, which uh, Jen Orgolini um, had mentioned uh, earlier today through her discussion. And Fort Z came about as a, as a dream to essentially become a net zero um, city. So within, as she said, a 50 mile square radius, um, we would be a net zero city, which is a big, big goal. And it's one of those big, hairy, audacious goals. But this day and age, if you don't have one, then you're probably doing business as usual. So we sat down. We had a very diverse group of people. We had different agendas, different people, different skill sets. But one of the resounding things that came out of our discussions in the very beginning was, OK, let's just pick something and do it. And so in, in looking at, um, and I'll show you how this is all unfolded here in a minute, but in looking through the possible progression, yeah, it's the low-hanging fruit case study. This is an ideal case study for how a community or even a business can go about taking just one small step, and then it all snowballs. So our, our goal was to identify what was needed to move forward. And we said, OK, well, um, restaurants are one of the highest users of energy and resources around as a service company. Um, they use a lot of electricity. They use a lot of water, and so on and so on. So we said, OK, let's go after restaurants. So let's see how we did. This is essentially uh, the depiction of, of uh, how this initiative fits into the Fort Z initiative in general. So as a, as a net zero initiative, by 2024, we want to reach that goal. How are we going to do it? You've got to attack both the supply side and the demand side. And as we talked earlier, as I've been working with Governor's Energy Office, RMI, and so on, the low-hanging fruit is actually the demand side. The supply side will come. There's a lot of work to be done on the supply side, both on dirty and renewables. A lot of this isn't going to change overnight. It's too disruptive. But you can do a lot on efficiency. So within that, um, we said, OK, let's take a look at the demand growth. So we said, OK, well, Fort Collins is going to continue to go up. Let's take a look at efficiency. And that's, that's really where we came to the restaurants. We said, OK, if we can get the majority of our restaurants to at least take a look for very low cost or no cost initiatives of what they can change, we can start making a difference. And that's what we did. So the low-hanging fruit, as you can see, um, I'm just going to concentrate on, on the graph on the lower right-hand uh, corner here. But of course, cooking, refrigeration, lighting, and cooling are the big deals. And so the Green Restaurant Association, as we, we started talking and networking and so on, collaboration again, um, they identified very effective ways where a restaurateur could change their practices that they'd been doing since the caveman era. And essentially, by just changing a few things, you can make a big dent in those top four items. So as I mentioned before, um, the Green Restaurant Association, they've got a, a chapter here in, in uh, Boulder. But they're a nonprofit. Um, they uh, have 137 or 136 green restaurant, green restaurant business um, experiences to share, just like this, which is really cool. So as, um, if you're interested, even if you're not a restaurant, 
just to ping this this company and say, okay, wow, you know, you know let me see what uh, I can do. It's a it's a great experience. Um, so they've got a, a program called um, DineGreen.com, which allows people who like to dine green or dine at restaurants who like to be green and, and purport to be green, um, help find those restaurants. So we, we named a, our program in Fort Collins Green Dining. And so it was a, it was a marketing campaign as well. Um, so let me kind of show how this, this played out. We went to the restaurants and we said, um, we will help you to recognize some of these benefits. Um, and by the way, we will also do some marketing for you guys. And so as, as a business owner, you say, oh, wow, that's a great deal. And so this is essentially how it played out. We had a, a first um, group of early adopters, if you will. Um, one of them was Carabas Restaurant in Fort Collins. And Carabas um, said, okay, I'm on. How can I do this? <clears throat> so just by changing his event orientation, the time that he turned on and off his lights and his heating, the amount of time his employees washed plates under the sink, um, we achieved a significant amount of savings. In addition, by changing this, his heating patterns, we also moved his peak loads, his peak electric loads and heating loads um, off peak, um, which on the restaurant business is a huge, huge savings. So he attained 30% peak load savings, a 25% decrease in energy use overall for a very, very low investment. He saved 100,000 gallons of water a day and to heat that water, he saved 260 million BTU of energy a year, which is huge. I mean, again, um, staggering is probably not even the right word. So what we call these guys, the early adopters were trailblazers. After that, um, a lot of other restaurants started saying, you know, wow, I like that Carabas model. Um, how can I do it? And so that's uh, kind of how that happened. It's just a graphic depiction of his energy costs and his peak demand costs before and then after. And again, it's a big, big, big win for both him, the city of Fort Collins, as well as the electric company. So every time on the demand side, the both the utilities and the business owners can decrease their demand, um, it's one less electric plant that has to be built, which is a big, big deal. And so everyone has a vested interest in doing this. So. Here's kind of how this uh, played out now, and as it's, it's more of a um, formal structure. Um, so if someone uh, were to come to the uh, Fort Zed team and say, I want to do this, um, you know, this kind of how it would happen. And this is what I wanted to portray to um, this, this group today, is let's bring this all together, and, and uh, you know, this is just one example. But it's a reasonable example as a, as a roadmap anyway. So someone comes to us and says, I want to do the, uh, the uh, green dining deal. Um, we'd refer them to get an audit by the Green Restaurant Association. Um, they'd also train um, some local experts as well. And so we have local experts that can go out to these restaurants and, and show them how to do it. Um, we'd also work on, as, as Greg mentioned, energy performance service contracting. There's a lot of companies out there that recognize that um, the variable frequency drives up in the blowers and so on, the uh, ballasts and, and the lights, um, all of these in, in older buildings can be changed out for a significant savings in energy. So then they took um, this model and they said, okay, well, we will go ahead and make those changes. We're going to own those changes, but by the way, you're going to save so much in your energy costs per year. And we'll guarantee that. But instead of writing the, the check to the electric company, you can write the check to us for a certain amount of years, but after a certain amount of years, you own those improvements. And so that's essentially a very simplistic model of an energy, energy performance service contract. What we do is work with these type of companies like Toll Mechanical, Bowdoin Gans, and so on, and we pair them up with, that, with the restaurants so the restaurants don't have any cost, which is great. So we work with EPC contractors, including the uh, refrigeration, HEAC, and solar and wind. Solar and wind, again, um, the cost benefit of, of those are coming down. We've got um, our distributed um, smart grid, distributed power and so on, so it's all coming together. But again, it's not going to happen overnight. So it's just, um, you know, we've got to start somewhere. And the new energy economy 
is going to happen, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen from a lot of initiatives coming from a lot of people, but we have to start somewhere. So we, we pair the restaurants up. We get the results. The results are um, in Fort Collins, the, the restaurants that, that um, go ahead and, and, and use this initiative um, are then added to the green restaurant um, bill, which is great. So someone who's interested in green dining um, will probably frequent your restaurant more, which is a great benefit, kind of cool stuff. So the next steps. So I've mentioned a few of them, um, but as a, as a small to medium-sized business owner, um, what do I need to do? So the big thing is research. I mean, you've heard a lot of things here today. Um, I'm immersed in it day to day. Again, I come from the supply side on the biomass and so on and so on. Um, but there's a lot of things that I'm exposed to on the demand side. Um, but if, if you're just a small business, medium-sized business owner, and you know, you've got your, your things you do every day, um, likely the best place to research is on the internet, networking, going to IFMA and BOMA meetings, um, getting to know people who are actually